This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Stay tuned to learn more. Around a year ago, I made a video discussing a book by political analyst George Friedman that was written in 2009 and it tried to predict the next century. Since it had been over a decade since it was published, I thought it would be interesting to see what he got right, what he got wrong, and what predictions just seem absolutely absurd. Like how World War III would be between the US, Turkey, and Japan, and that China would just collapse before then somehow. But as it turns out, George Friedman has made other books with weird future predictions, and at the request of you guys, I'm going to go over one of his first published works, The Coming War with Japan, published in 1991. That's right, this book predicted a supposedly upcoming war with Japan against the United States. What did this book think the war would happen by? About 2020. Well, that should make this extra interesting, so let's dive into it. The book starts out with an introductory disclaimer basically stating that George Friedman and his co-author Meredith Labard have no ill will towards Japan, nor do they want a war with Japan. Rather, they just think that it's inevitable due to various factors and cycles of history. Afterwards, Friedman analyzes what he considers the general grand strategy of the United States. Those who saw my Next 100 Years video may already see where this is going. The four strategies here are basically the same as in his future book. The U.S. will militarily dominate North America. No power challenges the U.S. hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. The U.S. Navy should dominate the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. And no Eastern Hemispheric power should be allowed to challenge the United States. With these strategies in mind, if a threat challenges those points, the U.S. will do everything it can to stop them, whether that happens to be Britain, Germany, Imperial Japan, or the Soviet Union. So if Japan arises to that situation again, like they did during World War II, then perhaps the U.S. would need to go to war with Japan. Again. Seems simple enough. But then the book talks about what Friedman and Labard thinks the grand strategy of Japan is. The book gives them five. To control the home islands under a single central government. To control the seas around the home islands. To dominate land masses that have access to those seas. To be the dominant naval power as far south as Taiwan and as far southeast as Iwo Jima and to secure and maintain control of access to Japan's mineral sources in either China or Southeast Asia through dominating the Western Pacific. Honestly, in my opinion, I felt like that could have been simplified further to just control the islands, control the local seas, dominate the Western Pacific. Either way, you can see how this mirrors Imperial Japan's expansions in the early 20th century and up through World War II. They tried to achieve those supposed goals by keeping foreign powers as far away as possible through naval domination. Okay, neat, but why did the authors think that war with Japan was inevitable? Well, we gotta look at the time period the book was written. You know how the past decade involved the West fearing over the rise of China? No, I don't mean militarily like the tense situation over Taiwan, I mean economically. The worry that China's economy would rocket past the United States and would cause the US to steep permanently into decline forever. It was something that people laughed at in the 90s and 2000s, but took seriously now and in the 2010s. For the 1980s and early 1990s, people had the same fears, but for Japan instead. Japan went from literally a war-torn country to the second biggest economy in the world, and at such a rapid speed that post-war Japan's economy was actually called the Japanese Economic Miracle. Admittedly, they had a jump start by the U.S. helping prop them back up after the war to help them serve as a buffer against Communist China and the Soviet Union, but even after the U.S. ended their occupation in 1952, the economy just kept growing at really impressive rates. By the 1980s, you finally had Japanese cars, electronics, and media starting to heavily compete or surpass their American counterparts in America. The U.S. also declined from a manufacturing economy to a service economy in the 1980s, which led to a huge trade deficit. To sum it up in basic terms, the U.S. was thinking, holy crap, Japan is outdoing us and they're going to destroy us in no time if we don't do something. However, such fears did not end up coming to fruition. Japan remained the number two economy in the world through the 90s, and has since even declined to number three since China surpassed them. So what happened? Basically, demographic shifts, Japan began to peak and then decline in population, and their excellent standards of living meant they had a badly aging population. Today, a quarter of their population are people over the age of 65. That's more than anywhere else in the world. Their productivity didn't slow down, but their available workforce did. 
Some people think the reason is because Japan society is simply too overworked to where more and more people now just don't feel like they can handle the stresses of raising families. Either way, by 2011, Japan's population officially started to decline, and that decline is not stopping anytime soon. Oh yeah, and then there was also an asset price bubble problem too, which certainly didn't help things. However, the authors of this book would have no idea about this in 1991. From their perspective, they see Japan's economic miracle as continuing, even if slowing, and basically predicting that as they control more of the economy, they'll politically assert themselves more and try to shake off American domination. The book asserts that they'll counteract America by focusing their economic exports to other countries, but that means they'll have to be politically aggressive since so much of their economy relies in imports of raw materials from elsewhere. Of course, this all ended up being a failed prediction. Now, despite this book being a prediction gone wrong, I wouldn't be surprised if you still felt like you needed to learn more about how the world works. That's why this video's sponsor is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is smart TV for your smart TV, and has thousands of shows and movies that cover educational subjects ranging from science and nature to world travel and much more. You can view these curated programs on any device to view anytime and anywhere, including several exclusives and originals. Some of you may be worried about another streaming service to pay for, because so many of them charge something like $15 a month, which can add up. But if you use the code TIGERSTAR when signing up for CuriosityStream, you only have to pay $14.99 for a whole year. That's like one and a half fast food meals for a whole year's worth of educational content. Sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description and you won't be disappointed. Thanks again to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Okay, so despite the prediction being wrong, what about the actual war part? Does the book talk about what will spark the war, how it will be fought, what are the dominoes, so to speak, that will lead to it? Well, the chain of events seems to be from the end of the Cold War. While the Soviets did not collapse by the time this book came out, the book does recognize that the Cold War is over and that the Soviets would at least no longer be a superpower. Because of this, the US propping up Japan and stationing troops there will be seen as costly without any geopolitical benefits since their big rival is no longer a threat. Therefore, the US changes the relationship and now Japan will view itself as a, quote, normal nation that now actually needs a foreign policy and will try to use it to support their interests without any longer needing approval from the United States. Of course, there is an American economic dependence to worry about, especially over raw materials, but the book seems to think that Japan will simply try to find other areas to guarantee its material interests to, and other areas to sell its products to, making it easier to shake off the United States. The book seems to emphasize India as an important ally of Japan especially. It also includes a map on what the predicted spheres of influences would be for Japan by the year 2000- wait, why does it- wait, is that North Korea? as a Japanese influence zone? <laughs> what? How? How does that happen? Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything about North Korea in the book related to that, just that South Korea would be a hindrance to Japan's plans. But I don't see how they thought Japan would be willing to ally or be able to politically dominate North Korea. Either way, a lot of these areas Japan wants to focus on do seem awfully co-prosperity sphere-ish. The book mentions that Japan will probably try to mend relations with China as a counterbalance to worrying about the United States, then Japan will build up its own navy using Singapore as an important naval base, and try to secure their trade routes to the Persian Gulf to guarantee a supply of oil. Despite Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution disallowing them to rebuild an army, their frustration of dependency on the US will eventually lead them to find ways to overturn it and do it anyway. These events will, in theory, lead to a regional Asia-Pacific Cold War between the United States and Japan. The book does not mention any specific casus belli, and even mentions it's possible it would just remain a Cold War, but it's convinced that a hot war is still possible and would happen when Japan must choose between subservience to America's influence or to expand in its own right. It's a little disappointing when you compare it to the Hundred Years book Freedom in Row, where he specifically details a casus belli of Japan pulling another Pearl Harbor, but on an American satellite and with the help of Turkey. Now that I think about it, I think Friedman might be obsessed with a war of Japan because honestly a lot of this stuff was simply adapted and slightly simplified for the next book when talking about Japan there. 
basically just delaying the time period from by 2020 to by 2050. A lot of this book does have interesting tidbits about the complicated relationships between the two countries, and a portion arguing that Japan is capable of building tanks that I do not feel qualified nor potential history-ish enough to go over, but it does seem to just be clickbait when it comes to the war part. What a shame. However, the book clickbait worked as this book apparently did well commercially. It was even popular in Japan, funnily enough. However, critics at the time rightfully pointed out how absurd it was, especially with its reliance on ideas like inevitable regional rivalries like these things are just forces of nature. Like, yeah, history repeats itself, but not that much. Despite the disclaimer at the beginning, this book was also still seen as pointless Japan bashing. In 1991, with this book's release, you can see that the U.S.'s unfavorability views towards Japan was growing, and in fact peaked in 1991, but has since heavily declined. Furthermore, the perceiving of this book as Japan bashing fits with a concern over a historical trend of xenophobia called the Yellow Peril. The Yellow Peril is a xenophobic and at many times racist idea that Asians are somehow an existential menace to the Western way of life. It was used as an encouragement for Europe to attempt colonizing China. It was used against Asian immigration to the United States. It was used when Japan defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. And it was definitely used in war propaganda against the Japanese during World War II. In a way, you can see some parts of that legacy still around today. When viewing today's concerns over China, most people are viewing China's human rights violations, its recent rise in authoritarianism, and the potential for war over Taiwan as things to be concerned about. And yeah, that's very understandable and concerning. But there are also some people today who just bash Asian people over it rather than China's geopolitical stances as a country. And that type of discrimination is unfortunately an ugly leftover of the legacy of Yellow Peril. While it's not wrong to say that we have overall gotten better since World War II, of course we have, but it's not like these ideas go away overnight. So considering negative views of Japan were at their highest since World War II in the year this book came out, the critics were effectively saying that while this book wasn't outright xenophobic, it did seem to be pointlessly adding fuel to the fire with its whole war with Japan is inevitable messaging. And honestly, with that context in mind, I kind of see it. At the same time, an important part of history is looking at stuff like this to understand what and how people were thinking. It adds important context for explaining the politics of the time, how people were organizing their lives, and what they were concerned about, even if it was a really silly thing. If for some reason you're interested in reading the book yourself, the link to an ebook version on archive.org is in the description. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.